So my friend Brandon Fertig is doing a video documentary on the homeless here in the United States. And we were hanging out uh, where we were hanging out, what, a couple of days ago. And we were, at, you know, at a, some bonfire and he brought up that he was doing this. Right. And and I said, uh, we got to do a podcast about it. So when this tent camp popped up along Highway 55 in Minneapolis next to a sound dampening wall along the highway, Brandon came here and started talking to people, and that was back in August when there were a few tents, maybe three, four, five uh, small tents. Now it's late October, and there are several hundred people here and a lot of tents, and they're bigger tents. So I would say check the blog at thebobdavispodcast.com for links to Brandon's social media and website and for links to stories about this camp. Let's walk and talk through the homeless tent camp on Franklin Avenue and 55 in Minneapolis. So why don't you just tell me about the camp while we're walking down there? Okay. It started when mm, a few people just pitched tents along this sound wall along the freeway. And they had tried it twice before, but the city did what the city does, or had been doing, and that is when they see a tent city pop up, they'll tell them to leave and they'll tear it down. But for some reason, the city went easy on them. The city said, okay, fine, whatever. And it grew and grew, and then it, it, it made the news. The Star Tribune wrote a story about this tent city. And then it exploded in popularity following political leaders coming out. So you're talking the governor, senators, uh, the mayor, and the mayor, promised housing for everyone here and at the time there were probably like 40 tents well since then you know wow. they, they had the green light to go ahead and build I mean we can almost see 40 tents right here and we're not even you know this isn't even a third of it Wow so it has gone up to about they say between 200 two and 300 people are here the vast majority are Native American and like it, it reached the end of the block here and so it started wrapping around and it did the same thing all the way on the other side. And it's a long block, too, so it's 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 substantial. So we're walking through now. Correct. We're, and we're in. They got fires. Looks like we got some cooking yeah, uh, they, grills they, and stuff. The city put porta potties on both ends of the tent city, and they were they were quickly graffitied. Um, yeah. All the grass that had been here is you know gone just from foot traffic. So it's basically a bunch of tents in dirt now, rather than grass. We'll see up here, some people dug in the dirt to create like fire pits. Obviously it's getting cold. It's Minnesota, late October. Yeah, what's gonna happen when it gets really cold? Well, they, they've actually been really good about anticipating the cold weather. So up here, those large tents on the left, like that army looking tent uh, up there, that's home to Natives Against Heroin which is the nonprofit that sort of became the default um, go-to uh, hub for like donations and food, but also like the, the security. And in fact, this is James Cross right here. Let me introduce you to him. Sure. Because he's the Natives Against Heroin uh, like leader. James, remember I mentioned coming here with a guy who does radio podcasts? Yeah. This is him. This is oh, Bob Davis. Bob Davis. Good, Good to meet, meet you. you. And we're actually recording now. So if, if, do you want to yeah. ask him a few questions? What's going on, Bob? How are you doing? Usual insanity. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I hear the... Uh, so he was just explaining to me a little bit about your deal. That you're kind of the, the de facto security thing. Correct, How did correct. all this happen for you? What's up? The founder oh, of Native Against Heroin. This well, as a moment, as a moment, we had to stand up. We got yeah. tired yeah. of singing about it. We got tired of praying about it. So he decided to do something about it. Right. And he did something about it. So we're out here making sure that that's why everything's here. at a calm, everything's cool, de-escalation, safety. You know, right. And just keeping it going and having a great day, bringing it as a human uh Human in a great community, right? Well, Brandon was saying that the sense of community here is amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't believe it. Because you got war veterans here. We volunteer our services here. Because we're war veterans. You want to go to combat? I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? You don't have to give me your full name. Just, you know. 
My full name? You, whatever. Yeah. Lieutenant Frank Joseph Killsright, 7 Special Forces, Green Berets. And what are you doing here? Watching out for my people. Okay. Tell them, yes, yes. You want to fight with me? <laughs> no, that's not good radio. <laughs> no. Actually, it might be good radio. It'd be good TV, but not good radio. <laughs> right, right. So that's what we did. We just stepped up as a movement to make sure that everybody's safe out here. You know, there's a Watch lot of for our a, a, addiction, right. mental health, um, you name it, it's out here. When's the worst time of the day? I think it's, you know, around the time when they get their money in the first when the sun 15th. goes down <laughs> I was, that's what i was looking for right when the sun goes it gets a little down. crazy you know i can but it's those special days when everybody has their money yeah you know but other than that it's just you know mostly calm you know mostly calm we're a community we don't need nobody to come here and monitor us and tell us what to do are they doing that we're doing it ourselves right but i mean are, are the is the city Nope. Yeah. Fuck the city. <laughs> we take care of ourselves. There's a lot of people that there agree with that. that. What's going to happen when it gets cold? Oh, we, you know, we see. We got a team. We I mean, we're, we're no strangers here. in Minnesota to no. cold, but no. you know what I'm saying. We're, I'll well, still be here. We're about I believe that you'll still be here. You know where I'm going to leave? But let's go on. A lot of people go. might leave, but some people might stay. Who knows? You know, you never know how... Who's out here for, you know, but being I'll real be homeless? Until my women and children get housed. When, uh, how many of these tents are going to be okay when it's 40 below? You think? None of them. <laughs> well, we'll find out. It was good to meet you. Yeah. Really good. But we're trying to get in winterized. Winterized. Yeah. I'm, we're going to walk down this one. We got the big cool. tent. We got the big good tent to meet right you. there that's, uh, you know, holds, you know, up to 35 people, you know, comfortably. We got the teepee. We got a wigwam out here. You know, uh, we, we're making them wrap their tents up more. We're trying to educate. Hey, how you doing? Ed, educate them how they're how they have to start surviving. So they, they just check with you, and they got a problem, then you try to help yeah. them solve it. Every time, you know, right on whatever it is, we try to do it right there. You know, because sometimes sometimes there's so many problems that you have to deal with it right on the spot, get it over with, and go to the next one. You know, if you, if you don't deal with it right away, then, you know, it might happen again. So how, what's your day look like on, on an average day? You, well, you my days is out here just patrolling, walking, 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 helping, organizing the food, keeping it clean, helping the garbage pick up their, help out the garbage, city garbage, pick up the garbage, right. uh, you know, go buy pizzas, go buy cigarettes, go buy coffee, do what we got to do and make sure that people's uh, needs are met. You know, start them in a good way of the day, you know. Make sure they're, that they're, they know they're loved and cared for. I got to tell you, I was out at the uh, pipeline protest, and this is a lot more organized. Than oh, the yeah, pipeline. definitely, and that's what we learn from, right? Yeah. We have to learn from the history. So we got to keep it going and make sure it's organized and make sure it's going in a good way. So how long do you think this is going to go? I mean, you know, just... Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, there ain't no fix on it yet. You got the navigation center, which is going to be... I know. Navigation center, which is going to hold up to 250. There's approximately four, over 400 here. Uh, like I say, there's three types of people. There's the ones that are homeless, there's ones that are here to party, and there's ones that are trying to make some money. Um, so we're trying to make sure that, you know, the ones that are making money are uh, talked to on a daily and pushed out. The ones that are... When you say trying to make money, what are they doing? You know, selling drugs? Selling drugs, you know. And that's not, and that's just not the addiction, you know. That's people that are obviously trying to entrepreneur for sure. their pockets, right? Addiction. If you're trying to, you know, sell a little to keep well and keep non sick, that's not dealing. That's just, you know, part of addiction. So we know that, and we see that. So that's why with new faces, you know, we have to continue to watch them and, you know, do our, our own investigations. So the plan here is to get everybody in some kind of shelter. That's kind of the deal. That's the plan, but that ain't reality. Right. Right. That ain't reality. Yeah. You know, it ain't gonna be reality. You know. But when you spend one, one point five million dollars for a six year, six months fix, when you could spend and make little tiny homes that are more efficient and are more uh, foundation that are more, you know, long lasting, where you can keep it going and build these people up so they can start uh, getting jobs, uh, getting into treatment, uh, feeling better about themselves. That's, the, that's, the, that's how you're going to fix the homeless problem. 
did did it, did any did anything come out of the police chief mayor uh, governor visit that uh, was kind of publicized? No, no. It, that's all it was, public publicity. You know, like I asked the mayor, "Have you been ever been homeless?" He said, "No." Then you can't feel it. Then you can't feel it. You don't know what's going but, on. But I mean, did they do anything? Or? No. I mean, they they voted to have that navigation center open. But other than that, if it wasn't for, you know, the tribals, you know, they wouldn't still have a place to go to. So are these people coming are these people coming from the reservation or are they coming from I mean they're all town? over, all over. I mean, you know, they're coming from St. Paul due to the St. Paul ones getting closed. They're coming from reservations, they're coming from under the bridges, in between garages, out of the trap house, out of wherever they garage yeah. yeah, every you know. So it's just keep on going in a good way and you know, that's why we treat these people like they're our relatives. Yeah. Uh, if you want um, to talk to kind of a, he, this guy up here, he's famous for his generosity. How are you? What are you? You did a Alan, right? How you yes. Doing? Yeah. How you doing, sir? This is Bob Alan Davis. Law. They Good call him the sandwich man. Oh, yeah. He's been I know about this. Where are you from today? I am uh, a podcaster. From where? From my podcast, the Bob Davis podcast. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is my 20 hour a day job. Yeah? No salary. 50, seriously, 51 years, except when I taught school for 32 years. So you've been doing this for 51 years? Well, I've been on the streets for 51. Oh, okay. I taught school for 32, and then it was like every day there'd be a group of kids, usually 40 kids with me. And we have no building, never received any money from the city, the state, the federal government, which surprises me being that I've been honored by three presidents. And I have an apartment with 17 freezers in it. And I live in my pension. You need a token, sir? Yeah. How are you doing this morning? Pretty good. You want a pop? I don't have any pop, but I got some pieces and stuff over here. But somebody has to care. And it's, to me, it's, it's almost a total insult for Native Americans to be living in tents with this. This is crazy. The whole thing is crazy. So, uh, and yet I'm real conservative. I'm not, you know, I think everyone should work. Everyone should do this. But we also have a lot of people that need a lot of things. And uh, so someone has to care. That's why I try to come through here during the day. If I miss it, I'm here at 2 or 3 in the morning. Yeah, you, so. I understand that you, your deal is you're out at, you go out at night. Oh, to, no, I go out doing the same too. Yeah. Last year, 350 churches made sandwiches for me. Right. It's not a religious program. I am a Christian, but it's not a religious program. And like, it's just uh, trying to help. That's it. In the last year, I passed out just about a million sandwiches. You know, this year it'll be 12,000 pair of socks. And the food, I don't pay for. You know, I'm at uh, businesses, whatever. Um, schools, last year, 130 some schools, 130 some businesses. So a lot of times during the day, you know where I slept last night? <laughs> My friend right here, he came over last night. I, I had a good sleep last night for 45 minutes at Bobby and Steve's to make a deal on food. I, I was so tired I couldn't get out, so I slept there for 40 and that was it. And I do this every day, I do it every night, and uh, even with cancer twice in five years, somebody has to care. And I don't understand. What do you think the biggest problem in this thing is? In this? Yeah. Well, first of all, it has to be uh, this group of people. I, my, my own thinking is that how do we put Native Americans in this situation? And I have no hatred, but then we wouldn't bring, we wouldn't bring people from another country and put them in this situation. Not even close to this. And so what we need is we need some structure, you know, a lot of positive things, not just a place to live, but some other structured programs, education, and other, other things. I mean, what do you think of, you got a few hundred people living here, and 99% of the time there's no problems, no fr even if they, you know, aren't friends. I mean, they might be from a different tribe, so forth, and they're still getting along. And when I pass out this, thank you, it's always, thank you, appreciate it. People appreciate it. So I, I don't understand why our mayor and the rest of them, I don't know. I've suggested before, to, and I've never met the mayor. He's called me twice to thank me for what I've done over the years, but I'm not politically involved. Right. But it's, well, they were here, and I, I asked, uh, you know, the... the the guy that's kind of been watching yes. things, if it, if it made any difference. Not a lot so far. They're talking about what they're going to do, and then they said some, by mid-November, mid-December, what are you talking about? Those of you that are, are making these comments, come over and spend a night in the tent. 
<laughs> Come over even in your own car and park for the night. I haven't slept in a bed in 19 years at night. I sleep in the sitting in my van, sitting behind the um, sitting behind the steering wheel, and uh, and that's it. But uh, in blankets, I've already contacted some churches. I got 70, 80 blankets coming in the next couple of days, and that's the, that's the advantage that that and what I appreciate is there's a lot of organizations that will come through. Not much with cash, but I don't ask for money. That's what's crazy. I mean, you ask for them to help pack to, things, to help that pack but, the food up. But I mean, and we turn around and I, I live in an apartment in Edina. My mother lost her eyesight and hearing and I'm going why would I want to live in the so that's where I live with 17 freezers and I rent seven storage rooms at public storage what's going to happen out here when uh, when uh, it gets really cold and it, we know it will I mean I don't know the only question is when I suppose you pray for a warm winter I pray that or pray pray I don't really pray for this pray that I win the lottery and they'd be out of here tonight 1.6 billion yeah that's insane too they'd be in they'd be in a hotel no matter what they'd be in a hotel the same night yeah. and they would behave, they would follow whatever. Good people, good people. So we're dealing with this two and three months later, knowing this weather could turn overnight. But even if it doesn't turn, I would like to be in a tent, no heat, anything else, with some of the winds that we've had. So I don't understand people. I don't understand it, and, and uh, I don't know. I've contacted a couple of the parties, and I don't know. One one lady even, I won't mention her name, in this area, in the Democratic Party, and she doesn't seem concerned at all. Oh, we're so proud about what's going on with the new immigrants here and all this, and that's fine. But what about people who were, they were the first Americans? And I still say that, you know, it's like it's almost like a, a slap in the face, disrespect. Like they're not important. Of course they're important. It's like I used to teach in my class. I'd say the richest man in the world is no. His kids are no more valuable than the poorest kid from Rwanda. That has nothing. Right. Well, those buildings over there are full of people from other countries. I know. You know. And a lot of them have a lot of driving nice cars and whatever. And that's, again, I'm not going to get into that. But the question is, my concern is, right, and they're my friends, too, a lot of them. But, I mean, free this, free this, I don't know. I don't understand it. Look at the basketball team. I saw something in the newspaper that St. Paul's trying to raise three or $400,000 for low-income housing and so forth. But we have basketball players making that money in one game. This is crazy. And when you add their shoe contracts, they're making twice that much. You know, if these athletes, and I've never heard from any of the sports teams as far as any donation, all you'd have to do is donate a couple games and you take it off your taxes. It wouldn't cost you a penny. What would they do with it? What, what, what's the idea of getting them into FEMA trailers or what's Get the them plan? into something right now. I mean, it's at least something trailers where there's some kind of heat, where there's something where it's somewhat comfortable. And myself, we're spending uh, more, more than $300 a day. To, to so, come down here. So, my understanding is a lot of these people are that drug addicts. Uh, that some are thing. probably What's not that much. That? Yeah, when some people, they're all on drugs. Like, what do you mean they're all on drugs? I can go to Edina and I can go to Richard. And there's not that much difference. The difference is they do it in a different way. They'll come in and buy their drugs and whatever. Yeah. But when and the biggest thing I see in, in the homeless situation is, is a mental illness with a lot of people. And not just that, but you, you've been, I mean, like the people that are here now, they've been homeless, for, most of them have been homeless for three years. And no one's really, for years, yeah. they haven't really cared. And all of a sudden, because of the supply and demand, that rent that used to be for that raggedy duplex used to be 500, and now it's 1,200, 1,400. So you can't really afford it. out here. Yeah, and you can't really afford it, and the, you, you're not making enough to, to, you know, to, to be able to live in, a, live in a place. And I don't understand this, and you look at from here all the way down in apartments, most are subsidized for someone else. I don't understand it. Is this what, you need a couple tokens? Yeah. Oh, you need. I'm going to let you get back to it. No problem. It was nice talking to you. Good talking to you, you too. Can you get a brochure? Sure. Yeah, call anytime if you have any. Get one for you. How you doing? Absolutely. No, it's crazy. <laughs> so, but it was nice to meet you. Good to meet you have too. Have a nice day. Good luck. And I hope things get better. You have a good day. Too. Thank, Thank you. you later. Thank you. How you doing? Hi. You can see, obviously, that there's no shortage of community outreach. Medical people on standby in case there's... And there have been a couple of overdose deaths, so... Wow, this continues way on down here. Yeah, that was the halfway point, the donation center, the donation point. 
and it goes all the way down to the end where that van is. It's so weird because this there's all these started. tents, and then you've got traffic right here. Yeah, what's three ways? Is this 94 or this 35? 55. So there were tents all along here, here too. Side. Yeah, there were tents here, and then they obviously mm -hmm. told them to go, and they put in these concrete barriers with a proper fence about 10 feet, 8 feet tall. So then now that they're cleaning all this up right now. Yeah, this was like the original. It started this was down it here. Right here. It started down here, and it just kept going back. And when I first visited on August 15th, I think was when I did my first interview down here, there wasn't much beyond the bend where that donation center is where you talk to Alan. Beyond there, there was just a few, you know, just a couple of tents sprinkled beyond there. And now, of course, it's, it's jam-packed. We're looking across 55 to uh, uh, building a building, uh, you know, an industrial building that is being torn down. So that's the Cedar Box Company, right? Or is it the one next door? Uh, the one next door. It's, it was a vacant building. I and they're going to put, they're going to put trailers over there and move everybody into the trailers. Correct. And then whatever happens after that happens. Correct. And then we got a we got a temporary police camera deal here. Both ends and on that boulevard, there are I think spot shotters and when did they uh, put those cameras in? after those the visit have been or? those have been here a while. Uh, I would say at least since August. Yeah, they put those in pretty quick. So this is the back end of it. It's funny how it kind of mimicked. A city where you look at the skyline of a city 100 years ago and the buildings were all like half the size they are now. Well, the tents were just these small little two-man pup tents. And then they've gradually gotten bigger and bigger. Oh, yeah. Like connecting tents. So now it's... And so now you walk into some of these things and it looks like the size of a, of a small like trailer house or something. Yeah, or all. I, I came by earlier, but much better mood today. Did you hear me earlier? Uh -huh. Oh, you were out? Yeah, I had to. So Earl was one of the original... 13. residents here and uh, he's the guy I first interviewed here on August 15th when there were probably 30 or 40 tents and now there's you know 150 uh, or whatever less than that it was less than that then what do you think oh uh, it's garbage horrific scary you know and depressing so this is not a good situation for you uh no no and in the beginning it was because there was only a few of us here and we were all dedicated to ourselves and we kept to ourselves basically kept it clean and um you know I mean, we all knew each other and we we all stood by each other then now there's people that are coming i mean now they're beyond the wall now you know and right it's just looping around you know, then now they put up this fence here for the snow barrier I'm, come on now you know basically trying to keep us in like animals just, you know. Yeah, there's a fine. What about the uh, the tribal uh, guys, the the, the the Native Americans against drugs or whatever it is? The uh, nah. <laughs> uh, they came here to support us in the beginning. Well, they more or less took over. Uh, they knew what things were going to be like and what was going to come in, so they got their hands dirty, and that's pretty much what it is. Um, now, would, when you say they got their hands dirty, what do you mean by that? Self-explanatory. Okay. Everybody knows what that means. Okay. You know, and it goes back further than that, you know. Um, once he publicized, publicized it all, and he got funding left and right, it's just... So now this has got, this has become a political thing. Oh, it's not just yeah, some people yeah, that are Yeah, my res I'm glad my reservation did not donate any kind of money or any time, any land or anything, you know. Um, Red Lake, you know, they're a sovereign nation. They can do what they want, you know. And all they can do is just live by their ways and rules, and that's where, how it's going to be over there. Um, I refuse to bring my kids here. Um, that's all we're waiting for. Here. Where are your kids? My mother's. Okay. And So what's the plan? You're going to stay here, you know, through the better end? or? Uh, pretty much. You know, they told her two months, up to two months. That could be up in December. It's going to get frigid as cold. Oh, it already yeah. is. Yeah. And we're going through, I'm going through one tank of propane, little, little green ones, one a night, just to keep my stove alive and hot and warm, you know. And now I made it into a complete L shape, so it's basically like a house inside. Yeah. You know, we got a bedroom, our kitchen, you know, our storage areas and so forth here. We started off with just a twin size, little old twin size tent that I bought from Goodwill for eight bucks. And we lived in that for about a month. Then we graduated to a bigger one, then another bigger one, then a couple bigger, bigger, bigger bars. So 
it's just you know like you wouldn't you wouldn't it sounds fun the way you're describing it <laughs> it is well it is it's, it's, it was exciting you know I mean now we just keep to ourselves and we just stay in yeah. you know we don't go no further than we have to what happens at night around here uh, it gets a little scary a little hectic you know you got your people who don't consider it nobody there's people here that work there's, there's women and children here, you know, that kids can get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go to school. You know, and you got people yelling around here all night long, you know. And So you kind of sleep with one eye open is what you're saying? Oh, yes, you have to. You have to. Or maybe you just stay up all night. We've done that several nights, you know, and you sleep during the day. Like right now, she's, she's sleeping, and she slept pretty much most of the day, and I'll sleep at night, you know. Okay. She'll stay up and watch me. Why does Minneapolis have more homeless people than Houston when Houston is quite a bit larger and there's no cold winters? When we originally talked about this, it was interesting because you said that uh, uh, what's starting to happen is that in, the, in back in the day, the Minneapolis Rex days, right, we... You know, the, the, the homeless were guys that were just either railroad workers and they were just drunks or whatever. And you're saying now it's got more of a cosmopolitan. It's changed over the years. And you got this problem in San Francisco and you got this problem in Portland. And apparently now we got this problem in Minneapolis. Yeah, it did change in like the 70s and 80s. And that's part of the history of, of, of that I hope to enlighten viewers with with this documentary because you think of homelessness as oh it's always been like this but you're right like back in the 50s so it's kind of the the timetable usually starts at the end of world war ii and i don't know if it's returning soldiers or what it what it was but then that's when you have the the quote-unquote hobo and rail uh hopping in the railway cars and things like that um the, kind of the classic hobo with alcoholic and raggedy clothes and he might be a day laborer he'd stay in flop houses one room places those flop houses were uh, understandably not liked so eventually they would and they were old buildings so they would get tore down those communities of hobos would disperse or even maybe disappear but what came about in the 70s and 80s and I'm trying to figure out the cause of this but that's when you saw the rise of uh, homeless who were truly homeless they didn't even have well what it is is I think part of it is the, the it's gentrification that's making urban rents now you know the, the whole thing of we want to now this is my opinion we want to subsidize all these apartment buildings um, we want to subsidize all these apartment buildings to create this amazing downtown and that sounds like it, when you talk to Alan Law that what it did was it drove rents up so now you can't stay in the in the in the dilapidated uh, uh, duplex anymore for $500 a month because rents are so up you think that's got anything to do with it see there's a, when, we can keep walking when you looked at the homeless in the 50s and 60s it was almost all white men well now white men are the they're they're not the the majority so what happened to those communities between the 50s and, you know, say the 70s and 80s? And that's where I think, that's why I'm interviewing older Native Americans, older African Americans. Because you talk to them and they'll universally tell you that they don't remember the homelessness like this when they were kids, like in the 60s or 50s. There was a breakdown in the community, is what I'm hearing from the older African Americans at least. Whereas before they would, you know, it's kind of the idea of we take care of each other, that kind of thing. And and now that sense has kind of, that sense of community is lessened. I wouldn't have come down here without you. I mean, uh, it, this is amazing. And you know what? You think, oh, this is going to be extremely intimidating and people are going to beat the hell out of me and stuff. But it's like, well, it helps that it's just people. To yeah. start with James is, is good. Yeah. Cause I did get a lot of hell when I came down here with my camera the first times. They didn't like it. Um, I remember I was interviewing Earl when he was showing me the rest of the tent city. So I was walking and talking with him. I had my phone on him because I was just recording with my cell phone. And people in the background were pissed. What are you doing? You can't take my, you know, so they didn't like that at all. Um, I think some, I think they've kind of gotten used to media. media. Yeah. And getting in with James is always huge because he's got more clout there here than anyone. I got enough for you, dog. My name is Brandon Fertig of Brandon Fertig on the Periphery. My website is theperiphery.com. And then you can find me on Facebook and Twitter and all that.
My YouTube channel is The Periphery, and that's probably my most popular and successful social media. With all the videos I've put together of interviews I've done uh, around the country and around the world, and I'm currently in the middle of a documentary about homelessness in the U.S. Uh, my interest in that started last summer, so two summers ago of 2017, when I traveled the Pacific Northwest and I saw the issue of homelessness in Portland, Seattle, Vancouver. And I'd planned on going back out west to interview people uh, around the homeless issue out there, like because along the west coast it's, it's, it's quite a bit worse than it is even here in the Twin Cities. But then this tent city that they call the Wall or the Wall of Forgotten Natives uh, popped up. And the city and the state let it let it stay, and that's really what has allowed it to grow as it has. Because it's the one tent city that sort of has the politicians' blessing to exist. When the politicians came out, it was a lot of lip service, uh, especially since most politicians in the Twin Cities are left-leaning. That's their that's that, that that's some of their go-to ideological like. They got to hit on those points, right? We got to help the homeless. We got to help the everyman. We got to help uh, those who need help the most. Um, and the city comes out, the governor, senators. But I think the sentiment within the the community, the homeless community, is that it was a lot of talk, and they're not happy with the amount of action they've seen beyond, behind the talk.